Yes, okay, we will start, I think. Very warm welcome, addressed to Katerina Botanova. We are really happy to, to have the possibility to listen to your report about what's going on in the last few years in Ukraine and in the artistic world. What does the situation of war, does it mean for the artists in Ukraine? And um, yes, what is the main impact for them um, on yes, which themes they are working on? And yes, is it possible to still work in art in these times? And yes, we are really happy to get this report from you. I just want to introduce you for a um, little bit. <laughs> I think your um, CV would be very long, but just to introduce you that you are born in Ukraine and you was the director of the Foundation Center for Contemporary Art in Kiev. And you are the founder and editor in chief of the online magazine for contemporary culture corridor. And you worked as a consultant for the EU, the EU National Institutes of Culture on issues of global cultural relations and for the EU Eastern Partnerships Cultural Program. And you moved to Switzerland in 2017. And since uh, 2015, you are the co-curator for the Basel Cultural Festival Culture Escapes. And yes, please, you're welcome. Add something important, um, moments of your life and work to this. And thank you very much to give us an insight and some impressions of artistic work in Ukraine. Many thanks. Thank you, Monica, and uh, hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to speak and uh, my gratitude to the museum for you know hosting the amazing exhibition that you are hosting. It's a it's a pity that I it's a bit too far for me to see it. I didn't manage, <laughs> although there's still a few days and uh, if there are those here online who haven't seen it but can, I highly recommend to see that. Um, probably the main reason I'm here is because next to the Fellow Festival Culture Escapes that Monica uh, mentioned that I co-curate and that keeps my professional connection to the wider wor world, so to say. Uh, I have been working, I'm working with the artistic um, and in general cultural field in Ukraine. I mean, I never stopped doing that, but specifically in the last two years, um, I mean, unfortunately, um, I've been working quite a lot on writing and lecturing and sort of doing the, the panels and the public talks precisely about what happens with culture and arts in Ukraine since the beginning of a full-scale invasion of Russia um, and how art and artists are dealing with the war and what does it mean uh, to be the artist during the war and how that influences the work and what's the role, is there a role of art during the war at all? Um, and I would start sharing my screen. I want to show you a few works and talk a bit about what artists are doing and have been doing this last two years. I see that probably the audience is quite mixed and I see some people who I know. I'm very happy to see Lydia Lihach. So there are quite some people with a background knowledge about what happens in Ukrainian arts in general. And I guess some people who have no idea. I don't have time to kind of bring you a wider picture and a full context, but I hope we have a bit of a Q&A session after that and um, you can ask me. So give me a second, I share a screen. So I'll probably start with um, the title because the title you saw in the announcement, Artists Against uh, the War, uh, I um, made a step from that title. And the reason why I did it is because um, Artists Against the War sounds very, um, you know, artists can be against the war when the war is happening, happening elsewhere. Right, you can be an artist in Switzerland or in Germany and protest against the war, and it's a great thing. Please do it. But when you're artist in the country which was pulled in the war against, you know, her will, and against her any uh, intention, 
then you have to understand that being against the war means um, only being for the victory because the war cannot just stop. There is no magic. And freezing the war the way it is now means that all the people who are on occupied territories um, and many artists that I talk will talk today about, they come from the territories that are currently occupied, some of them since 2014, some of them since uh, you know last two years, um, they still have relatives there. It means that their lives and lives of their families are in a huge danger. And if the war um, continues, um, then at least Ukraine has a chance to get the people and the people, human lives back. So this this position of art as being against the war, it's it's um, a bit doubtful for me. So I would like to talk and tell you today about artists and art within the war. Because what happens um, with Ukrainian artists, again, since 2014, because you know we're talking about the long war, it started in 2014 with annexation of Crimea and um, the war in Eastern Ukraine and the full scale invasion in a way is, uh, again, unfortunate, another huge step of something which had started 10 years ago. Um, so, the artists within the war, um, they have a position of insiders. They're witnessing and they're living uh, through that every day. And regardless whether they are still in Ukraine, because some, some artists never left Ukraine. I mean, left a few times for maybe exhibitions and public events. Uh, some artists left Ukraine early uh, in the beginning of full-scale invasion, but then come back. Certain artists left and didn't come back yet maybe they will never come back but that's also the the story about the full-scale invasion and the huge displacement of people so the artists are just a sample of what is happening with um, people in ukraine in general um, and i wanted to start the talk about you know the artists within the war and art as evidence because i think what we will see or i will try to show you is what artists are trying to do when they're inside the war they're trying uh, to collect evidence. They're trying to collect the memories, uh, the facts and also feelings of what has been happening and what is happening now of people, of events, of places that are not just distance places, but usually, you know, it's somebody's house, it's somebody's life, it's somebody's land to collect them and that allow, allow them to disappear, to vanish um, into oblivion and also not to be you know, buried over or sliced over with another events that are happening every day, something comes. This this uh, sensitivity towards people and things and events and, and places not to be forgotten is quite high in uh, Ukrainian society in general nowadays. And I wanted to start with this picture. It's uh, a, a picture of something which in a peaceful time would be called um, a, a home exhibition. <laughs> There is a tradition in uh, Soviet times and also was kept a bit, you know, after the fall of Soviet Union, when the, the availability of spaces for free speech, free speech was limited, artists would have, hold uh, um, little exhibitions in their homes and their apartments. Uh, and this tradition of little kind of apartment exhibition was also kept, you know, later when there were not enough resources and artists would invite their friends and have a kind of apartment exhibition. Um, apartment of the art research and curator Katarina Yakovlenko in Irpin, which is one of the suburbs of Kiev, northern sub suburbs, which name you might recognize because it's one of those parts uh, where invasion initially started. It was occupied by a uh, Russian army in the spring of 22. And after the deoccupation, quite often awful things were discovered. You probably know more about Bucha, but Bucha and Irpin are neighboring towns. So Katarina used to have an apartment in Irpin uh, and she was lucky to escape it before it was bombed. It was a last floor of apartment house and the bomb went uh, straight through the roof. She left Ukraine and she learned about the fact that her apartment doesn't exist anymore when she was already uh, outside. She was uh, hosted in a residence I think in Vienna at that time. She came back in August 2022 to her place and together with the other uh, uh, people who inhabit this house, they started kind of collective crowdfunding to secure this house, to put the roof and to reconstruct it slowly. But that, that moment when she entered the space and understood that everything that she used to have 
uh, from very material things to kind of material slash symbolic things, because also her collection of artworks from her friends, artists, her books, her pictures, her everything is just gone. She decided to invite the fellow artists that were in Ukraine at that time to show their works. Um, there was like one day exhibition that was called Everybody's Afraid of the Baker, but I am grateful. And the story behind this uh, kind of strange, probably tired title is that there actually was a story of a baker who lived in one of those um, suburbs of Kiev and was driving every day with a fresh breath to another suburb, which was occupied, going by the Russian army, being absolutely in danger for his life every day to bring fresh uh, bread to people. And some people were afraid of him because like, why would he do it? Maybe he's, is he strange? Is he a spy? Um, but there are other people who were grateful. And this duality of, of the situation, this impossibility of um, events that are happening, and Katarina tried, I guess, to you know, catch um, in this one day exhibition with works from the French artists. Some of them also at that moment lost quite a lot um, in her apartment. Let's kind of keep it maybe as a certain image um for this talk and um when i think about you know the to the talks and and the discussions about what happens to art during the war is it even possible why do we need it i mean war is a very material thing you know the resources are limited maybe those resources human resources and material resources and also emotional resources maybe they should be should be invested you know elsewhere but then uh i cannot stop thinking about this uh, quote from famous German philosopher Theodor Adorno, um, uh, Austrian story, who, you know this quote, and this quote is interesting because also was mis misquoted so many times. It is usually misquoted. Because quite often you can see that um, he's referred as uh, to be saying that writing poetry after Auschwitz is impossible. But in fact, what he said is that writing poetry after Auschwitz is, you know, barbarism. Why is this misquotation and what did he mean by, you know, barbarism? Um, I think it's easier to imagine that creating art after something which is kind of impossible to, to imagine and impossible to understand is also impossible. But in fact, what he's saying is that it's not only possible is also necessary but you cannot create it the way you used to do before this impossible event happened that would be a barbarian act which means disrespectful uh to the pain and to the suffering and to the lives of those people who went through this impossible event um so when i look through the eyes of adorno and and his thinking into um how the artists have been artists in ukraine have been working uh with the war again since 2014 but specifically since 2022 since uh the full-scale invasion i think it's precisely what was happening there was understanding i think first more intuitively and with time sort of more and more consciously that creating art now again regardless where you are in Ukraine or outside, uh, is not possible the way you used to do it before. And one artist who we will see in a second even said, um, quite quite uh, important artist and also quite well represented uh, in the European Museum and Galleries, she said that she asked her gallery to stop selling any works that she did before 2022. So she exhibits and she sells only the works that she started to do after the full-scale invasion. And she stayed in Ukraine. She just moved to uh, Western Ukraine for a few months and then she came back to Kiev to remind and not to let slip the fact that the war is still happening and the people are still suffering. So when we talk about the artists and their practices and their uh, ways of dealing with the war, uh, a bit simplified for the purpose of a short talk, what I decided to do is to um, show you two strategies. And one strategy I uh, called saving, but we can also talk about, you know, bearing witness because saving means, you know, document, documenting 
um, keeping the memory of something which has happened or is you know happening now, but it also means give a voice to something or someone who might not be able to do it themselves anymore. It's also about the preservation um, of effects or memories that are important, not let them be forgotten. And the simplest thing, of course, is the work. I mean, the simplest, <laughs> it's really not simple, but maybe the first thing that is obvious to everyone is, of course, the work of the photographers. And it's been a lot of photographic work done uh, since the beginning of full-scale invasion. You probably know that um, this war has been called the most documented war in human history. Uh, and there is an initiative um, which started by it's a private artistic institution in Kiev, Kinchuk Art Center. They started it very early uh, in 2022. It's called Russian War Crimes. They collect um, photographs from prominent Ukrainian and international photographers, uh, and they showcase them around the world in important political events. For example, the Russian War Crimes House was twice in Davos this year and last year. Um, the work which is not done by uh, uh, photographers, but actually by two video artists, Roman Hime and Yerema Malashchuk, uh, but is also documentary. Uh, it was also exhibited in the Russian War Crimes uh, uh, House in Davos this year. It's a story about the Ukrainian children that have been and you know still are kidnapped or you know deported by Russians. There is a huge uh, work being done by uh, many um, activists and volunteers and lawyers to bring the children back. So Himein Malashchuk uh, talked to a few families and a few children who managed to you know, get back. And they put a camera next to their bed and filmed how they sleep to show the peace of the, 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 the sleep of children, but the memory of absolutely not peaceful and horrible things that should have never happened to them, which is always there with them. Another way of saving and documenting is um, also through photography, but I also wanted to show you here because this is a work by, uh, I mean, the mosaic itself is the work by Ukrainian dissident artist from 60s, Ala Horska, called Boreviter in Mariupol. Uh, and the fact we have, why we have a picture of this work is because another Ukrainian artist and photographer, Yevgen Nikiforov, uh, took uh, a challenge several years ago to travel around Ukraine and to document Soviet mosaics that were destroyed. Uh, and now, as you know, you know, Mariupol is uh, occupied by the Russian forces. Many buildings are erased. Let's not talk about people. And the recent picture from, I mean, not so recent, that's a picture from uh, last year, shows that this uh, part of Ukrainian art history and history in general uh, is being destroyed and non-existent anymore. Um, another documentary, documenting and actually research and reconstructing work is being done by a uh, group of artists, researchers, um, fantastic multidisciplinary group called Forensic Architecture with a base in London. What they do all over the world, uh, they collect accessible evidence of crimes and based on accessible evidence, they reconstruct what has happened. They did so uh, for several occasions in Ukraine. They did it for Mariupol. And here you can see they did it for one of the early hits on Kiev, uh, the hit was, uh, which was in the vicinity of the Babin Yar Memorial. Um, another work by Ukrainian um, filmmaker and artist Alexey Radinsky called Chernobyl 22 is a short documentary uh, which won the, the, the prize in Oberhausen Festival, which is based on the phone footage um, of the workers of the Chernobyl nuclear power station that recorded um, the moments when the Russian troops entered and occupied the station early in 2022. So based on their recordings and on their talks, Odexi is trying to reconstruct what actually happened in those days when the station was occupied by Russian troops, uh, which definitely put, you know, not only Ukraine, but the whole Europe in a huge danger. 
artist Aleptina Kahidze, we see several works of her today. Um, she engaged especially early in, uh, in the invasion, but actually she's doing it still up to now into creating a sort of diary. So in a very quick and sketchy manner, first daily, later a bit less than daily, she would create a snapshot of a day or event or a feeling that she had in any given moment of time. Um, the one with the most words that you see is actually the, the drawing that she did uh, on her birthday on 16th of March. Um, she lives in the suburb of Kiev. And at that moment, the occupation line was just five kilometers from her house. And she was lucky enough that it didn't move in. And she shows herself and her dogs and her computer in the basement of her house. And you see the figure of her husband with a gun sort of guarding the territory. And she writes a message, um, the message to the world community and to world art community. Uh, she is very active internationally. She has a lot of uh, friends and colleagues in the artistic field elsewhere. And she's writing a message to them uh, saying, you know, thank you that you want to host me and you offer me, you know, help of getting me out of Ukraine. But you cannot take all 42 million of people and also my house and my art and, and you know, everything and my husband. So do you have any ideas how we can actually, you know, stop Russians instead of getting Ukrainian people out of Ukraine? And in those sketches, every day she's showing, um, you see her knitting with a candle and you cannot really see it well here um, on the slide, but it says that in a peaceful time, uh, fellow artists in Europe are creating me, creating multimedia art, and I'm meeting with a candle. And on the other uh, picture, which you actually can read, um, and I think it's quite striking, she says, I'm still alive in Ukraine, sort of thank you for asking, but it's rather an accident, meaning that every day that unfortunately can change. Documenting also means documenting uh, emotions, documenting certain moments and in a way legitimizing the emotions because the war, when you're inside it, is a very personal and a very subjective uh, feel. And this is a work by Anna Zvegintseva. Um, and it's a picture of her daughter. And it's usually exhibited as a picture and the message when somebody against, you know, from the friends saying, how are you? And she said, well, when air, air red sirens went all over Ukraine, um, I didn't know I can feel hatred so deeply. I saw a photo of a dead kid who had the same hair as my daughter. Another way of documenting emotions, but also the moment I wanted to show is a work by Tamara Turlun, and it's called Heart Like. Uh, you might have seen that the early days uh, of invasion, uh, you know, in the fear of the um, air attack, uh, Ukrainians were putting um, paper or scotch on the windows, right? So if the window is broken, the, the shatters, the little pieces of glass are not going to, you know, kill people or, you know, damage. Uh, what Tamara was doing, she decided to be put more kind of love and peace in this process. And she was cutting, this is a very traditional Ukrainian, but not only Ukrainian technique of butinanka, which is just simple piece of paper, which you fold, right? And then you cut out and then you can unfold it and it reveals different shapes. So she was creating those various shapes and putting them on the windows to protect herself and her family. Um, and another feeling, which I think is also very important throughout you know, the whole war is a feeling of gratitude. So what you see here is a work by Stanislav Turina. Uh, Stanislav is uh, in particular known for working extensively with um, uh, neurotypical people and people with uh, mental disabilities. So he didn't leave Kiev early, although he could. He himself is disabled. He stayed with his community. And this um, series of watercolor uh, drawings this is just one, he has many of them. It's, it has a word, thank you, Dyakuyu in Ukrainian written on it. And he calls this uh, work, uh, thank you coupons. So you can tear off you know, one part, one coupon with the word thank you and give it to a person uh, whom you're grateful. And usually it means that you're, you're grateful to people you know, 
to whom you cannot ever show enough gratitude, you know, to volunteers, to soldiers, to people, you know, who support and save lives of the other. So art becomes this medium of expressing unexpressible in a way, and also a document of this immense gratitude that a lot of Ukrainians are having towards each other, but also towards the people, thanks to whom they're still alive. Um, another way of you know, dealing with the war being an artist, and actually, I mean, they're not two opposite ways, actually, they're uh, rather, you know, um, overlapping, I would say, is to fight, but fight also means, I mean, there are artists that are fighting in the army, quite physically, but we're also talking about the symbolical fight, the symbolical act of, um, you know, rebellion, but also, which is, I think, very important, of, you know, raising awareness, Art is a method of talking, especially to you know outside audiences, to um, allies without whom Ukraine's existence in this world would never be possible. You know we cannot fight alone. It's not it will never succeed. So what art does is, um, yeah, it also fights. This work is actually, I really like it. I show it quite often in my lectures, but also I think it's been in most exhibitions of uh, you know, Ukrainian art, which was created since 2022. It became in a way a symbol, although it was actually created a few days before the full-scale invasion, but when understanding that something's gonna happen was already in the, in the air. Um, it's work by a wonderful artist, Katerina Lisovenko, where she kind of replays, reappropriates the very classical, Christian Orthodox figure of a mother protecting a child, but only in this case, the mother and the child are showing what they think to the occupiers. Um, another work by Jana Kaderovan, she is actually the artist that I quoted before. And let me see what I can make it a video because actually it's a video. Okay, we'll just leave it for a moment. Uh, so yeah, it is a video. Uh, Jana was the person who said who uh, forbade to sell her works uh, that were created before 2022. Uh, the work Russian Rocket is a series of stickers that she gives away to friends, artists, and also to people who come to see her exhibitions. And she asks them, and she also does it herself, to put them on the windows of buses and trams and trains and airplanes elsewhere in the world that the people can maybe for a moment imagine a little bit and maybe even feel a little bit what the Ukrainian people feel when they see how the Russian rocket is actually flying. Another work of hers, which is, I mean, this is a, 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 the whole novel in one work. Um, this work is called Palenitsa. Palenitsa is a Ukrainian work for a loaf of bread. And the idea for this work came when Jana and her partner relocated to Western Ukraine early in the full-scale invasion. And uh, they were living in a little village in the Transcarpathian region and next to a big uh, river. And Jana saw the river stones that looked like loaf of bread. And she thought that, you know, Ukrainian tradition, again, not only Ukrainian, of course, to welcome guests with a loaf of bread and a pinch of salt but this bread is uneatable this bread is too hard and she suggested to um, give this kind of bread to the russian invaders to show that they're not welcome the trick with this work is that um, following the tradition with her other works uh, she's selling this installation and it's a super popular actually it's been bought by major museums and private collectors all over the world. She sells it, one loaf of bread, I mean, one stone is being sold, um, one euro or one dollar, depending, you know, maybe one franc who buys it per gram. So usually one loaf of bread is about three kilos. At the moment she sold, the last interview I read with her, she sold um, 250,000 euro worth of loaves of bread. And all the money she collects, she donates to a uh, Ukrainian army. One way of showing resistance, but also resilience, uh, is the work of Katerina Olinik. Those are works that have been shown in Vienna in the uh, uh, framework of Kiev Biennial. But that's a series of her works where she, her paintings, where she um, paints 
um, seemingly abandoned or neglected gardens and rivers. And there's also a personal story behind it because she often talks uh, about her family garden and she comes from uh, Luhansk Oblast. So inaccessible anymore because it's on the other side of a line of, of a fire. But she also kind of works and shows that the nature being abandoned by human beings who are fighting, the nature is fighting for its, its own fight by trying to absorb and digest and um, in a way bring back to a peaceful condition the remnants of the war, you know, the mines, the shells, but also the, the remnants of a human body. Another way to, to fight, and this is also the work by Leftina Kahinze called Invasion. It's one, uh, one, one sheet of paper out of uh, 16. The work is in a collection of Tate Modern now. It was purchased after she showed it in Manifesta in Pristina in 2022. Um, and Leftina also works a lot with a parallel between invasion, you know, the army invasion, invasion of you know, Russia to Ukraine, and invasive plants. What does it mean? Can can people behave like plants? Because invasive plants, they invade, but they don't kill. They have a different attitude. But also, how do uh, people in harmony with plants can um, you know can can create something which is an opposite of the world of the war? And in her idea of the earth as a garden. She talks that, um, I mean, you can read the story here that when she was, again, sitting in the cellar because it was a air raid siren, she was thinking that there was an idea developed in Ukraine in the Soviet times and then abandoned about the perennial wheat, which means wheat that has roots so deep enough that you don't have to reseed it ever. So if the, the development of perennial wheat can be sustainable, then bread, as she says, can, can uh, um metaphorically but also maybe less metaphorically grow on the fields and you know we can pick it up as we pick up apples from the garden and the earth can become a sustainable garden um another work by also jana kadyrova called harmless war and here i want to come back uh you know again to this notion of you know raising awareness because um what artists came to understand quite early in the war is that to fight symbolically, but also be an interlocutor who can allow um, the outside audience, those outside of Ukraine, those who don't know much, those who might not even want to know much about the war, to let them feel, I mean, all of us also outside of Ukraine, feel in and try through the feeling, understand a bit what it means when the war is happening. Um, Jana creates this series of works called Harmless War when she, um, she shoots the pieces of metal to create, you know, the, the, the pattern of holes. Then she wraps these pieces of metal in different shapes. So you see a pyramid, you see a cube, and then she works around the holes the way that they're not harmful. So if you look closer to the holes in those uh, metal pyramids and cubes, they're twisted and covered the way that you cannot scratch yourself. And this is the paradox of the harmless war, which is harmful to people on one side, but harmless to the outside observer. But also maybe there is a paradox because maybe in reality, it's not harmless in any given moment. And I think we will finish with the work which was created very early, it was created in uh, uh, March of 2022 in a, one of the Kiev basement by one of the probably most well-known and uh, kind of important Ukrainian artists, Nikita Kadan. Um, and it's very, in a way, simple and obvious, but it's also, I think, it's been the work which was exhibited the most, because sometimes very obvious messages are the hardest to grasp. The obvious messages are sort of seen as, as banal and, and not important. But what Nikita is saying, and what do I want to repeat after him, that in any war, when you're on inside, then we, the people, very concrete people, artists and non-artists, we become the price. And only by remembering this, the war can be stopped, which in this case means that you know, it has been won. And the very, very last thing, 
since we're talking about in raising awareness and you know what happens to artists during the war, I think there is always something which each of us can do. And I strongly believe that there is no war which is you know too far. Um, the worlds that are happening around the world are always very close to us. And if we can do one little thing, um, I think we should try to do it. Um, this is the Ukrainian Emergency Art Fund, a fantastic initiative also run by curators and artists that since the beginning of Full Scale Invasion was uh, collecting money and helping artists to uh, survive and to work. And if you have a wish to help, there's a PayPal or you can just Google Ukrainian Art Emergency Fund and you will find a, a button donate on their website and please donate a bit, even a few francs. They will really make a difference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katerina. But um, yes, it's not easy here what to say. Um, I think you're totally right to give the title of uh, the evidence and uh, the artists are within the war. That's right and it's necessary to explain uh, this difference between art against war or within. The war. Um, yes, I, I mentioned some points as very, yes, um, um, strong to do that. This collecting, the, the, the moment of collecting, the moment of collecting evidence, the collecting of memories, documentation of memories, the documentation of uh, the emotions and I think that's really strong that these artists you presented and explained that she take the decision that nothing has to be sell anymore um, before the war. And it's, um, yes, it's, it's a total, totally different life of being an artist and creating art, I think. And uh, yes, you give up the, um, us the impression to get a bit more closer to these um, feelings for the people and, of course, for the artists. Yeah, but it's really hard, of course, and um, I think maybe other people have some question or want to add some comments. And I would also be grateful if people put on the cameras because then uh, I can actually see whom I was talking to. Mm -hmm. uh, if that's okay with you, whoever is uh, willing. Mm -hmm. That would be nice, that's right. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. And of course, I want also to welcome Lydia Lichac, our cooperation partner of this exhibition, and it depends on Lydia that this exhibition um, was possible to present in Switzerland. Thank you so much, Lydia, for your engagement Thank you. and your Thank work. Thank you, Monica, Katerina. Mm -hmm. It was very nice and good information, even if you think you know everything. It was very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lydia. I see that uh, Andrea has a a question or a comment. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Um, hello together and uh, hello Adrina. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot uh, for your presentation. It was very interesting and um, it was impressive to hear you from far away. So I'm a teacher and I'm here in the, the museum. So um, Monica will show us the exhibition afterwards. And now we um, were listening, my pupils and me, uh, to your presentation. And among them, there are three Ukrainian, Ukrainian uh, girls too. And um, yes, I would like to... Um, ask you two questions that are combined. So the first is, um, are there are possibilities uh, for Ukrainian people to go to museum now to, to see this art. 
at all. And um, if they can see and visit these museum, museums, um, what's the impact of art on civil persons? So, I mean, um, yeah, what's the impact of, of, of this kind of art um, of on, on their life, on their everyday life, uh, maybe also on the motivation to keep on living and also to keep on fighting? I don't know. What do you think? I know it's hard to believe from outside, but you wouldn't imagine how full cultural events are in Ukraine. I mean, all over Ukraine. The exhibition openings or, you know, the guided tours or the theater shows. I mean, in Kiev, to get a ticket to a theater show is next to impossible. They're booked in a kind of in a moment. And I think that shows, I mean, on one hand, of course, also shows that, you know, people are very, you know, we're very social beings. So being together and experiencing something together, uh, especially if this something is very relevant to what you're living through is very important. But the main thing is, I think, is it, it, it testifies to uh, the most important thing about art, which I think in peaceful kind of normal life, we tend to overlook because there are other sides. And, but the art during the war and the white art inside the war kind of highlights this uh, function of this role of art of making sense of the reality. Of uh, and so it's not only about visual arts; it's about basically you know, any form of art, literature, and film. It's, with the film, it's a bit more complicated because it's a much longer and more complex process. But with visual arts and literature and theater, it is a digestion of experience and trying to make sense and bring a certain feeling and 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 um, notion of importance to what is happening. So the, the, the culture in general is this collective thinking mechanism that allows societies to connect to themselves and to make sense of their experiences, of their histories, of their nowadays in the extreme circumstances like the war, like what's happening in Ukraine now, becomes very, very vivid. Yeah, and I was myself actually also quite surprised. You know, you come to uh, you know to Ukraine and you see this enormous amounts of people, basically, you know, celebrating life, but also celebrating, um, you know, the power of art. That's fascinating. I think. Thank you. I think that's really the point. What we could learn at the moment from Ukrainian people, um, the Yes, the consciousness about the necessity of culture and art. It's not, yes, um, it's really necessary for, 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 the, uh, for the human, for human being and the society. You know, I had a discussion with um, some um, members of the festival board, you know, the Festival of Culturescapes, which is a Swiss festival. It's here, it's in Basel. But the festival works with, um, let's say, fragile cultural landscapes in Africa and South America. And when we bring artists from those regions for festival in Basel, um, then one of the kind of responses from a few board members was that, that there's, there, too much politics in this art it's too much activism and then you see and i mean it, it, we try to discuss and highlight the gap between actually the role of art in those fragile contexts and you know ukraine actually became now also one of the fragile contexts when the artist cannot not connect to what is happening around them because what else do you do i mean what what kind of life you're living um, so in this sense, I think it's also interesting, and I think this is a discussion which will, you know, still be coming um, more and more intense about the solidarity of artistic experiences of artists from around the world that experience, I mean, not similar, but in a way complicated and uneasy um, um, circumstances, and how, you know, how to deal with it, how to talk about it, how to place you know, yourself as an artist within it. I think it's a big global conversation which is happening, but 
in a way, you know, Ukraine is also joining it now. Again, unfortunately, but also fortunately, because I think it's an important conversation. Lydia, you are in Kiev at the moment. No, no, no. I'm in USA. Oh, and you are in USA. Okay, <laughs> but that's good. I have a problem mm -hmm. to go to mm -hmm. some place from USA now, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, what was your experience in the last time to, um, yes, with the art events? Um, maybe exhibitions or what, um, yes. Can you explain how it was for you and what you realized in this time to visit exhibitions or concerts? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, a lot of ex uh, exhibitions in Kyiv uh, and you very, very active uh, now Ukrainian deem, deem they, they gave place for many uh, curators and it's very interesting it's it, it's in in the center and i was last time in october september october in kiev and it was very interesting avant-garde music concert from that uh, it's so interesting it's like i never see before or never hear before that um, what they do and it's also international project and Mestetsky Arsenal always has their exhibition, M Museum of Hojar, theater. I I did not buy a ticket to, to theater, but it's always like Katerina told, it's always booked <laughs> if you mm -hmm. can next month or something. But, but it's still like today, you know, today we had uh, maybe 60 rockets on all Ukraine, Ukrainian city in Kyiv a lot and um, life like like usual. Uh, yesterday I uh, a little bit uh, talked with my one colleague because he, uh, he is man and he's afraid. As a woman they don't afraid and they go to home to sleep and if I, I found yesterday that he lives in office <laughs> because he is afraid to go home or something and only it was i don't feel today very well because i told him yesterday maybe it's not good idea <laughs> to to sleep in office and he go home and you know have an it was very close um, near his house and other rockets come mm -hmm. And another museum, two two museum, um, who work in that Kurohovo museum, two women, uh, they lost their apartment. I I saw today they find money for that too. It's like every day something, but it was uh, quiet before, like couple weeks. Even even uh, Stella Benyavina was saying, it's not good, but it's quiet <laughs> because we are relaxed. We want to that, uh, be ready for everything every day. I, and that other woman, Stella Benyavinova and her foundation, she has exhibition, very, very interesting. Uh, she had like our auction uh, of um, one, oh, I forgot his name, very popular Ukrainian graphic. And people buy, collectors buy his um, his works and they gave money also for that uh, mm -hmm. Pepe Bo, who is keep mm -hmm. sky on the key. I was also really impressed with uh, Olela Balloon explained uh -huh. that um, lot of, yes, the people of the museums, you know, uh, the curators mm -hmm. and uh, everybody. Um, of course, some of them are still live in the museum to, um, yes, take it safe, the space of the museum, and that they are working at the museum every day. And then mm -hmm. people, the public, the people are coming to the museums, even if the walls are empty and um, 
the people come and go to the museum, visit the museums to have some, to have some art talks or yes, some lectures, whatever, to yes, to live yeah. art. Mm -hmm. Yeah, museums yeah. in Ukraine are coming, you know, are coming now quite, a, you know, I want to say interesting, but I'm not sure it's the right word, but a peculiar experience, let's say, because they cannot operate as museums because they cannot show their collections. Uh, and mostly mm -hmm. their collections are not there. They're elsewhere stored safely. I mean, we're talking about the museums in the more or less safe cities, right? We're not talking about the museums that are, uh, you know, in occupied territories that are looted or destroyed. That's a separate story. But those that are relatively safe, um, they, I mean, none of them close. So they, they do operate, but they have to start working with the contemporary forms of art, right? You cannot have your collection, so mm -hmm. you have to work with what is there. And they become those, uh, you know, hubs where the art which is happening now and the public which is eager for this experience meet, which I think also influences a lot the understanding of the role of a museum. You know, it brings to the forefront, you know, not just the research and collect and kind of exhibit the heritage, which, of course, is still important and they will come back. But also how to, you know, what, what museums in Switzerland also face. Like, okay, how do you connect to public, especially to a younger public? How do you bring something which mm -hmm. is more relevant to them now? Like, how do you do that? And here you have Ukrainian museums actually doing it in reality. And yeah, and then you have, um, yeah, quite active, um, quite true. active audiences there. Mm -hmm. Katarina, what do you think? You presented a lot of artists, different artists to us. Um, in which kind we could help to support the artists? What could be the role of um, yes, Swiss people, Swiss museums, Swiss curators, um, or in other Western European countries? What could we do to support them um, to yes to to give the sign that it's really important what they are doing for us as well? Well, I think the most important thing is you know to give a a, a space to show the works, right? To let this the message that is in the works to come through. And in this sense, I do believe that the Swiss museums and Swiss cultural institutions can do much more because they unfortunately have not been active you know when i look at the you know museums and i mean again we talk about only visual art now but in general let's say museums and, and cultural spaces in germany for example um there are much more happening you know mainly solo exhibition mixed exhibition historical contemporary so the, the understanding and the voice of what is happening in Ukrainian art scene. I mean, also historically, retrospectively through the 20th century, because you know the artists that are here now, they didn't pop up out of nowhere, right? There's a huge tradition and a big legacy behind them. So also um, there are several big exhibitions in, in Germany last year that showed the scope of uh, Ukrainian art over the 20th, 21st century, but also smaller exhibitions, like again, Jana Kaderova had a, a uh, personal, uh, big personal exhibition in um, uh, Hamburger Kunstverein. And next year, I think early 2025, uh, three Ukrainian artists will have, um, like, the duo and one artist will have two big personal exhibitions, also in Hamburger Kunstverein, for example. But in Switzerland, it's a very, very few. So what you were doing is uh, pretty unique, actually. But I think that can be more and be wonderful to have. To have more, there's a, a lot of fantastic artists. Yes. And do you know about other projects who will come in Switzerland? No, not yet. I, at least, yeah, maybe not yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all, uh, Olga Osace, who was uh, in the talk in your program in November, right? If I'm not mistaken, and she uh, with a colleague did. Um, mm -hmm exhibition where three Ukrainian artists were showing their work together with a collection in uh, the cantonal collection in Geneva and Villa Bernasconi. Um, among them, Katarina Lisavenko, whom I showed, Anna Zvagintseva, whom I showed, and Alitina Kekinze, whom I showed. So the three artists had three works. But there are quite a lot of Ukrainian students in uh, Art Institute here in Basel also. Mm -hmm. But exhibition-wise, there are no unfortunate. Mm -hmm. 
And what do you think, what is the biggest fault of our Western European thinking about this situation of being artists in the times of war or creating art in these times? Um, you started with the change, with changing the title from art against war to art within the war. What I think you're thinking a lot about these um, yes, these faults of understanding and misunderstanding a lot. And what do you think is our biggest fault to understand these situations? Oh, I think there are many, but maybe one worth mentioning since, you know, yeah, it's connected maybe to the topic of our talk is, um, you know, the, the pacifism as, as, a, as a movement and as a state of mind, right? The, the conviction that, you know, the wars should not happen uh, is fantastic. It's very important. I also think that wars should not happen. But the thing which is quite hard to understand sometimes, and I have a lot of those discussions with colleagues all over Europe, is that pacifism is only something which can come out of safety. Mm -hmm. Only if when you are in a safe position and nothing endangers you, we can look elsewhere and say, okay, you there, guys, don't have a war. Stop it now. Whatever it takes, you know, stop supplying weapons to Ukraine because then the war will start. Well, when you're inside, you understand the only thing will happen if you stop supplying weapons to Ukraine is that Ukraine will be completely occupied by Russia. And then we've not been talking about, you know, the, the awful massacres and, you know, genocide in Bucha or in Zoom you will have the whole country facing that reality. So this price of peace and what it means peace and what it means war, I think it's really hard to understand when, especially, you know, especially in Switzerland, which didn't see war for hundreds of years. But unfortunately, wars happen and Ukraine is just one example or one case or many others. And this changing of attitude towards what is actually happening in each particular case, because they're all different. And to understand that in Ukrainian case, there is a perpetrator and the perpetrator should be stopped. And the perpetrator is not the person. It's not Putin's war, right? It's the whole country. And there are millions of people directly and indirectly involved. And if the P Putin goes away now, the war would not stop because the society will never accept it. And this is a horrific thought. But this is something which has to be accepted because that's the part of reality. And then I believe, you know, the solidarity and support, which Ukraine has been very lucky with, and we're very grateful to all the allies and partners who are helping on all possible levels, starting from, you know, ammunition and, you know, ending with whatever, just emotional support. But it's unfortunately not enough because the war is not over yet. And it is going on, and it has to be stopped at a certain moment. But pacifism is not the way of stopping it. Yeah. Are there any other questions, maybe? Yes. Um, then. Again, you to Katerina, the last word from you. I was, uh, I'm very grateful for the invitation and for the chance mm -hmm. to, to, to talk to you. Mm -hmm. And thank you for audience for staying with us, you know, in the evening for a whole hour. And I hope that uh, what you've heard and what you've seen uh, will be of some use to you and maybe change your state of mind one way or another. That would be my hope. And thank you, Monica, very much. And thank you for the Open Art Museum for hosting the exhibition. Yeah, thank you to Lydia for this. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And thank you, Lydia, that you know you made this thank, even thank possible. Thank you very much. So, yeah, I think Monica is our Ukrainian hero for, for Am this ambassador event. <laughs> ambassador, yeah, one of. I hope so. Lot. Yes, yeah. thank you very much. That's super thank important. Thank you, Open Museum. Yeah, thank you, Open Museum and all team and all staff and everybody. Thank you, Katerina. It's very nice to see you and hear interesting information.
Okay. Yeah, thank you, Lydia, and thank you, Katerina, and please uh, send our um, big honor to the artists whenever you talk to them. Um, and um, yeah, I'm traveling to Ukraine in March, so I will see most of yeah. them. Yeah, okay. please do this. Mm -hmm. We need them. Okay. Thank you. Thank you thank so you. much, and thank you all, and uh, yes, have a good time, wherever you are. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.